90s and early 2000s saw the peak of the new metal era, and whilst artists such as Korn, Limp Bizkit and Linkin Park ascended to almost pop star status on a global level, there was another side to this movement. It was darker, heavier and possessed an industrial edge to it. American Head Charge, Spine Shank, Power Man 5000 and Godhead, amongst others, were all part of what you could call the underground new metal scene. They didn't quite reach the same heights as their now globally recognized counterparts, but if it wasn't for them, the new metal era definitely would not have been anywhere near as interesting. At the same time, the grunge movement had come to an abrupt halt, and in its place came the battle to dominate the alternative indie rock charts with bands like Hole, Breaking Benjamin, Puddle of Mud, and the Smashing Pumpkins fighting for the top spot. Amongst this melting pot of post-grunge groups experimenting with hybrid genres looking to make their mark, one band from California were about to make a huge impact with their debut album released via Warner Brothers Records. Their first single, Push It, would become an instant anthem for the alternative youth of America. It was aggressive, powerful, and resonated with fans in a very distinctive way. Wayne Static would be a founding member of this band. His unique look and stage presence, along with his now instantly recognizable vocal, all contributed greatly to the success of the now legendary group. Although sadly, a long history of substance addiction would ultimately lead to his downfall and tragic death. They would release six studio albums between 1999 and 2009 before going on hiatus sometime in 2010, which led Wayne to releasing his first solo effort in 2011 under the name Pig Hammer, which would also be the final album he would release during his lifetime. This is Wisconsin Death Trip, the story of Static X. Tour going. Where are you guys playing next? Wayne Richard Wells, born November 4th, 1965 in Michigan, America. According to his mother, Darlene Wells, he was a pretty chilled out kid and certainly wasn't any sort of hell raiser. I have to tell you that out of all of the kids, he was probably the one that was the most mild mannered and easy going. He really just was a great kid. He did well in school, pretty much kept his room clean and never complained about anything. Wayne would be exposed to music from a very early age, as his mother was also a musician. I played the organ for the church and did side work playing for weddings, funerals and such. Wayne came along quite often, and so he was always around music, either outside of the house or in it. There was always music playing, and all of us play some type of instrument and have even performed together as a family. He had two sisters, Amy and Lisa, and a brother, Jeff and clearly came from a very nurturing and musical family, a family that fully encouraged his pursuit in music. When he was seven years old, he won a local talent contest after playing a song called Skip to My Lou on the $10 guitar his parents, Richard and Darlene, bought for him. This song itself appears to be an old American partner stealing dance from the 1800s, which today appears more as a nursery rhyme. Not exactly the type of early musical influence you'd expect to see in Wayne Static's musical career, but he was only seven years old at this point. However, even before this, he was already showing an interest in music after receiving a toy guitar around the age of three. We really didn't have a choice in the matter. He was going to play something. He had a little toy guitar that he got for his birthday or Christmas when he was two or three years old that he called his Botar and he literally slept with it. We couldn't pry it out of his little hands if we wanted to. Fast forward a few years and his interest in music continued with the school marching band, as well as joining the Cub Scouts. It seems Wayne would discover one of his biggest influences when he was around 18, the American industrial metal band Ministry, formed in Chicago, 1981. <laughs> 
around the age of 20, Wayne decided to move to Chicago himself, where he would form a post-punk band called Deep Blue Dream, with drummer Bobby Pomerero, bass player Eric Harris, and also Billy Corgan, who would go on to form the Smashing Pumpkins. Deep Blue Dream, formed in 1987, would only release one self-titled EP in 1988. And yes, that was Wayne Static singing. After this, it seems Wayne would play in what he described as a thrash metal band for a while that also consisted of Ken J on drums, who would become the drummer for Static X. This band was called Battery, and although only short-lived, they managed to release one demo tape in 1994. Cloud. And it would seem that Wayne had already moved to Los Angeles at this point, simply to be in a warmer climate. By this point, Wayne was tired of trying to get signed with his previous bands and may have even thought that it just wasn't going to happen. But he didn't give up and his move to Los Angeles would be the birth of what we now know to be Static X. <laughs> I decided I was going to move to California because I was tired of the cold weather in Chicago. Started looking for people to play with and uh, started this band just to have a good time, really. I, I had pretty much given up on trying to get signed at the time. And, uh, I was playing in this, this thrash metal band in Chicago at the time, and, it, and we had come on to LA to do a record in 93, November of 93. So we made the record, and then we drove back to, to Chicago in a van. We got back to Chicago and it was like 10 degrees, an ice storm. I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm, I'm fucking out. I'm done with this shit. I fucking gave notice at work. And I went with my credit card and I bought a pickup truck. And I took everything I could pack into my pickup truck, put the cats in there, and drove across the country. And I knew one person in LA. So they let me stay at their house for like you know, a week or whatever so I could find somewhere else to live. Had this, all this massive credit card debt. So, you know, I was broke ass, you know, musician. I didn't make money. So I, I, what it is, I got two credit cards. I bought a truck with one and I lived on the other one for a while. Static X would actually form under the name Drill in 1994 with a slightly different lineup. Drill would consist of Wayne, Ken J, Tony Campos, and Emerson Swinford. Swinford would soon take a very different musical path as he went on to play guitar on films such as The Power Rangers and Planet of the Apes. This left room for Japanese guitarist Koichi Fukuda to fill his shoes, which is where the name Drill was dropped and Static X was adopted by what would become the solid lineup for this industrial new metal outfit starting in 1995. Static X would become known by most as an industrial new metal or alternative metal band, with the latter being a much broader spectrum of metal music. Alternative metal was generally considered to be a fusion between alternative rock and heavy metal. Alternative rock and alternative metal included almost any band you could think of, ranging from Jane's Addiction to Red Hot Chili Peppers, Alice in Chains to Stone Temple Pilots, and Radiohead to Green Day. And the roots of both of these genres generally date back to the early to mid-1980s, with many bands crossing over into both genres. Static X, however, wouldn't just be inspired by metal music. Their sound would also contain elements of electronic dance music due to the wide variety of influences held by members of the band. I was a dance buyer for the record store I worked in in the late 80s. I listened to a lot of techno for a while. There's nothing new that has caught my imagination, but 94, 95, 96, I was listening to a lot of stuff like Prodigy and Crystal Method. The biggest artists to influence Wayne specifically were Ministry, Prong, The Prodigy, Crystal Method, The Chemical Brothers, and even System of a Down and Coal Chamber. 
As Wayne states in an interview recorded in December of 2010, when asked if White Zombie may have been a potential influence on Static X after they released their 1995 record, Astro Creep 2000. Zombie is really not much of an influence, it's more like an inspiration. When Astro Creep 2000 came out, that was around the time that we were just starting to experiment with adding electronic instruments to our music. It was very inspirational to see this band doing it successfully in the mainstream. The main influences other than Ministry are Prong, Crystal Method, Prodigy, Chemical Brothers, and then some of our peers from the LA area like Cold Chamber and System of a Down who we played a lot of shows with before we got signed. Ministry, formed by Al Jorgensen in Chicago, 1981, released their first studio album with Sympathy in 1983. And although Ministry is today seen as more of a band by most, it is essentially the sole brainchild of Al Jorgensen, who writes and records the vast majority of material. But in 1983, there wasn't much of an industrial sound to Ministry on their debut record. It was very much a synth-pop vibe, however, by the second record Twitch released in 1986, the dark edge to Ministry's tone was very much present, and by the time Static X had formed in 1995, Ministry had already released five records for Wayne & Co to sink their teeth into which included one of their most notable records, Land of Rape and Honey, released in 1988. Prong, formed in New York City 1986, would also be another big influence for Wayne and his Static X vision. Prong became pioneers within the industrial metal scene, and founder of the band Tommy Victor quite confidently stated that if it wasn't for Prong, Fear Factory, Static X, and New Metal probably never would have happened. Fear Factory wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Helmet, Godflesh, and Prong. I could say that Static X wouldn't exist without Prong and Ministry, and the list goes on. The whole new metal scene, I don't know if they would have been brave enough or the labels would have been able to sign these bands if it wasn't for Snap Your Fingers, Snap Your Neck. This sounds like I'm bragging, but it's true. Tony Campos, Static X's bass player, would even state later in his career that Prong's 1996 album Rude Awakening was pretty much the standard for Static X when it came to influence. Unfortunately for Prong though, Epic Records dropped them from the label after the Rude Awakening record only sold 10,000 copies in the first week of its release. Wayne was also a big classic rock prog rock fan, and like many others from his era, he was huge on KISS. I like Journey, Bad Company, Soundgarden, and Aerosmith. I like bands with really good vocalists, because I've always been jealous of dudes that can sing really good. Rush, probably one of my all-time favorite bands. I've never met them because we're obviously a generation apart, and we are a whole different style of music. I've met a lot of other great bands like Kiss, Black Sabbath, and Ronnie James Dio before he died, but I never met Rush. I would love to chill with them. Kiss was also the reason Wayne decided to pick up Gibson guitars. I was a Gibson guy all the way from the start. I've always been a Gibson guy because Kiss was my favorite band when I was a little kid, and on the back of every Kiss record it said, Kiss uses Gibson guitars and Pearl drums because they only want the best. It said that on every record. And then there's The Prodigy, arguably one of the biggest EDM artists to influence many aspects of modern metal music in recent times. Music for the Jilted Generation, released in 1994, 
and The Fat of the Land, released in 1997, are two of the most commonly cited influential albums of the last three decades when it comes to the fusion of industrial metal from an electronic dance music point of view. You can't deny the effect that Metallica had on everybody. It gave me a whole new perspective on how to play the guitar, how to use the guitar. Probably, I would have to say, and Justice For All would be my favorite Metallica record. Prodigy Fat of the Land, to me, I thought was going to usher in a whole new era of electronic dance music, melded with vocals and actual songs. And I still rock that album all the time when I'm driving. And in 1999, Static X would combine all of these inspirations and unleash their powerhouse debut LP, Wisconsin Death Trip. In 1997, Static X signed to Warner Brothers Records. A year later, they would release Wisconsin Death Trip. They wanted to produce the record with renowned producer Terry Date, who by then had already produced records for Metal Church, Soundgarden, Dream Theater, and even Pantera. Date had also produced Prong's 1994 album Cleansing and White Zombie's Astro Creep 2000. However, it seemed the cost of Terry Date wasn't quite within the budget for Static X. Instead, they went with the next best thing. Ulrich Wilde, who had been Date's right-hand man for some years, working on many of the same records as Terry Date. So it made sense that given some of the influences of the band, especially Prong, that Static X would want to work with Terry Date. Aside from this, Tony Campos, bass player for Static X, brought a slightly different set of ears to the table with his love for bands such as Suicidal Tendencies, Cryptic Slaughter, and Stormtroopers of Death. Coincidentally, the debut album from Stormtroopers of Death, released in 1985, inspired Al Jorgensen of Ministry to start adding thrash metal elements to his music. The overall Static X sound, however, would come to be known as Evil Disco. They ended up with the term Evil Disco and Keeping Disco Evil. There was an odd thing about this record, which was half was a rave and the other half was a mosh pit. And at a live show, you'd have all the dudes at the front headbanging and all the chicks in the back dancing. And that's what was so fun about this record. Ulrich Wilde, Static X producer for Wisconsin Death Trip. The title for the album was taken from a book first published in 1973, and it was called, you guessed it, Wisconsin Death Trip. The book, written by American author Michael Lessie, charts a myriad of numerous and grim bizarre occurrences that took place in and around Jackson County, Wisconsin, mainly the city of Black River Falls between 1885 and 1910. In addition to the collapse of the local economy after the closure of several industrial mines, the people were plagued by a diphtheria epidemic that claimed the lives of numerous children, as well as having to endure a series of violent crimes, murders, suicides, arsons, religious delusions, mental illness, and superstitions. It's not clear how much of the contents of this book guided the actual direction of the record itself, but it is an interesting link. Video, you guys, who's your favorite band on the tour? Lincoln Park. Static X Lincoln Park. Thank you. Thank you. After the album was released on the 23rd of March in 1999, it would enter the Billboard charts just three weeks later and take the number one spot on the Billboard Hate Seekers album chart on the 13th of November 1999, where it howled for six weeks at number one, spending a total of 79 weeks in this specific album chart. In the same year, Static X would tour with the likes of Type O Negative, Fear Factory, and even Megadeth, as well as landing a slot on the now iconic Ozfest festival that included Rob Zombie, Deftones, and System of a Down, amongst others. Make some noise for Shovel, System of a Down! 
helping to push Wisconsin Death Trip to be certified gold in the United States. This alone was helping to spread the Static X message to the entire alternative youth of America, and at the same time, new metal and alternative metal was almost at its peak, with System of Down already having released their debut record featuring Sugar. Corn had unleashed Follow the Leader, with the massive singles Got the Life and Freak on a Leash, helping to push the new metal sound to the masses. And of course, bands such as Deftones and Slipknot were helping to diversify the overall vibe of this chaotic movement. However, the party wouldn't last for very long. I think the second record will be very important for us. Since our first record was successful, we're taking it very seriously. We want to try to progress our sound, build upon what we started. At the same time, we don't want to abandon what made our fans happy in the first place. With such incredible success so early on in the Static X camp, the pressure of having to produce a second record that would at least be as successful as their debut would cause tensions to flare and push the band to breaking point. Over the course of the next few years, Static X would tour heavily to support the release of their debut record, whilst also having to write music for their follow-up record, Machine, which would be released in 2001. Wayne was so focused on trying to write the next album that he says he didn't even really get to appreciate the early tours he did with Static X. It was really just a whirlwind and I barely remember it. We worked so hard and toured so hard that I don't even remember most of it. We played 300 shows in the first year and we just never went home. I didn't even have a home. I lived at the rehearsal space for the last year before we started touring. I had to quit my job to make the record, so I didn't have anywhere to even go home to. I look back at it now and I kind of wish I had taken the time to sit back and appreciate it more. Wayne basically spent two years writing the next record by himself whilst on tour. Wisconsin Death Trip was essentially split four ways in terms of songwriting, musical contribution and royalties, which everyone at the time was more than happy with. Wayne, however, felt like he was now the only one putting in the effort for the next record. I spent that whole two years writing Machine in the back lounge of the bus. My whole mindset was, holy shit, we've got a platinum record and we're going to go home after this and we've got to go into the studio and people are going to expect another platinum record. So while everybody else was out partying and having a good time, I was sitting in the back of the bus writing Machine, which I wrote 100% by myself. That caused a lot of problems and that's when everything just went to shit with the band. Wayne even stated in an interview some years later that the band never should have continued after Wisconsin Death Trip and that Static X's second album Machine, released in 2001, should have been his first solo record. I did it for the fans because I knew they were attached to certain players. I just did my best. In retrospect, it was kind of all a waste of time. Machine should have been my first solo record. Machine debuted at number 11 on the Billboard charts, selling over 80,000 copies in its first week, which was huge for an industrial metal band. The album featured one of Static X's most popular songs, Black and White, with the music video depicting the band members slowly turning into Terminator-style machines. However, one thing was missing. Koichi, the guitarist. Koichi had decided to quit due to the ongoing tensions and conflict within the band and was replaced by Trip Eisen, who would end up being fired in 2005 after facing various criminal charges. Trip was formerly of the band Dope and Murder Dolls, Murder Dolls being formed by Joey Jordison in the early 90s. Ken Jay would be the next member to leave Static X in 2003. Ken Jay would be replaced by Nick Oshiro but it was all pretty much downhill from here. Although Static X continued to release albums up until 2009 with Cult of Static, 
and Koichi even rejoined the band in 2005, the band just seemed like a ticking time bomb. It just fell apart. No one had the same goal anymore. Koichi got married and had a baby, so that's all he cared about. He didn't care about the band anymore, or going on tour, or making a record. Nick, all he cared about was his rehab, and turned into a complete dick. Me and him were like drinking buddies, and we were friends on the road, and we hung out all the time. He turned into a total dick who would lecture me about drug use all the time. And then you got Tony, who thinks he's the coolest guy in the world because he hung out with Al Jorgensen for a year and suddenly wants to be a part of everything when he never was before. Everything was just like a mess. It was just a mess. Static X would officially break up in June of 2013, and a year later, Wayne Richard Wells, better known as Wayne Static, would be found dead by his wife Tara on November the 1st, 2014. He had sadly passed away due to a toxic mixture of prescription drugs and alcohol. Wayne had struggled with various substance addictions, anxiety, and even depression over the years, and this was truly a sad ending to his story. His wife, Tara, who he adored, would end up taking her own life just two years later in 2016. My job is to make people happy. I go on stage and I see people's faces light up and I see everyone smiling. I don't see people fucking banging their heads and shit. I see everyone smiling at me, having a good time and singing along. I'm just really glad that I can provide that service to everyone and take an hour out of everyone's shitty day so that they can have a good time and enjoy themselves. So thank you to all of my fans for sticking by me. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing until I'm dead. Rest in peace, Wayne Static. Thanks for watching, and if you want to continue the discussion about Static X or any of your favorite bands, then do feel free to come and join our Discord server absolutely free with the link in the description below. Or watch another documentary right here on Raw Music TV. Music